dialogue. Dialogue, a presentation of the Public Affairs and Special Events Department of KLRB News. This is Dialogue Assassination with Research Specialist May Bressel for KLRB. I'm Gloria Barron. All right, May, um, one thing I wanted to ask you about. Um, about a, two months ago, in, yeah, September 20th, um, John Smith was killed in San Jose. And um, I was wondering if you could bring us up to date on that uh, that particular uh, slave. Oh, yes, I'd be glad to do that. Um, when we went on the air, Gloria... The week of that death, that murder in September, I mentioned it to show my listeners how I collect articles or smell a situation out on a murder or assassination, political assassination, or how I learned to study murders after I studied the political assassinations. And if there was no conspiracy or a particular crime involvement, intentional crime, um, you pass these things off as being either self-defense or a different kind of circumstances than a political intonation or meaning to it. But Monday, September the 20th, a gentleman named John Smith Jr., who works for the IBM company in San Jose, was coming home at 4.45 in the morning, and he was pulling up to his apartment. He had passed a... Um, traffic light supposedly and then pulled up to his apartment and there was an officer behind him and the officer wanted to give him a ticket and two plain clothes men officers pulled up I suppose they weren't in uniform it was 445 and asked officer Willie do you need help with this ticket and he said no he was all right and the officer parked their car the other men parked their car anyway and the began to help officer Willie in a confrontation with John Smith, the chemist, research worker from IBM, and John Smith was shot and killed. And the thing that caught my attention was that the plainclothes men were told that they weren't needed, but they parked their car anyway, and it was three against one in the back of a residential area on a traffic citation. This was Monday, and then Tuesday, the... Chief of Police Murphy in San Jose made the statement that his officer did the proper thing in killing Mr. Smith because it was self-defense in that Mr. Smith was running towards his apartment and they thought he might get a weapon and therefore he was shot. But he was I noticed that he was shot in the chest and you can't, if you're running away, you'd be shot in the back. And I was very curious to know why the Chief of Police would defend three men ganging up upon one man at 4.45 in the morning. And other people were beginning to wonder about that, too. And we made a show about that where I called attention to watch what is happening in San Jose because the problem in our society with regard to law officers is no different than Ramsey Clark getting on the air and television one day after Martin Luther King was killed and saying, it was a lone man in no conspiracy. This was the Attorney General of the United States. You see how my mind works, Gloria? And I know that these people, to come out and tell you a thing without going into the evidence, means you have to go into the evidence. Because the Sunday after the murder of Martin Luther King, Ramsey Clark was on Meet the Press, and he made the remark, we have the assassin on the run. You know, and they said, well, you don't even have a suspect who is running. You know, is it one man? Is it ten men? How do you know? And Meet the Press posed the question. Ramsey Clark really couldn't answer it in a way that satisfied my mind. So you realize that when you're studying the overthrow of governments or local communities or states, there are what we call cover stories that we've gone over on the show many times. And to divine it for people who haven't heard, a cover story is the front page item that you're supposed to believe that has no basis in fact. 
if the chief of police in San Jose wants to say, we will investigate this murder. This citizen was an honor student. He went through on scholarships. He was a brilliant boy. He had worked his way up through the system. And he was black. I didn't know that the first two days. And then there was a picture of him in the paper. Um, if the chief of police had said, this is a terrible thing, that a man was killed on our streets over a thing like this, I'll investigate it. But he didn't. He covered it. Now, that was September the 20th. What's happened since? On November the 4th, a month and a half later, chief of police uh, has been reprimanded by the city council. Officer Woolley has been charged with murder, with manslaughter. Two days after the, the killing, assemblyman up in Sacramento, Domley and Alquist said, we have to get into this. A citizens committee was formed. I made many, many phone calls to Sacramento, to San Jose. I called the district attorney's office up there. And I said, I'm interested in this particular murder as the four or five days went on. They had used mace in this gentleman's eyes and they let dogs out to chase a police dog and the circumstances were just terrible. He was lying on the ground screaming for help when these three men were after him. And since that time, the autopsy shows that he was beaten up and bruised. Um, I made many calls to San Jose, and I said, I want to come up to your police department. They said, don't you think we can handle this ourselves? And I said, no. I said, if the attorney general of the state of California is a defendant in a charge that he's covered up the conspiracy of murdering Robert Kennedy, and if he was a district attorney in Los Angeles at the time Robert Kennedy was killed, and I offered to come down and give them information that he would not accept, how can you at your level tell us that you can handle it when on a larger level it's covered up. If the Attorney General of the United States covers up evidence, why can't the Attorney General or District Attorney of San Jose? Now, what has happened is that one officer has been charged with murder, another has been suspended, and the third one is still walking around. But a very unusual thing happened this week, which involves the citizens of the United States, individuals, was that a gag rule was imposed. And the aftermath of all this work is this fact that the officer, Woolley, who killed John Smith, was charged with six illegal acts. For one thing, he had murdered, and the second thing was he was carrying illegal mace. But they have a news gag now that you can't know the four other things that he did that were illegal. And the other officer that has been discharged from the staff now is charged with three illegal acts against John Smith. Now, there's been a gag rule, which I'm going to work very hard in the next week or two of the Citizens Committee to break, because this silence that happens in your country, like in the national security interest, in quotes, you can't see the archives and the evidence on John Kennedy. When you allow these kind of lies to be the law of the land, then at your local level, the gag rule is put on people, and they say, we're charging a man with murder, but we won't tell you what he did. Now, reverse the situation that a man has committed a crime in San Jose, and he is a radical or an ordinary citizen who went berserk. They would tell you all six things he did for which he was arrested. And I am going to say now that no human being is any different than any other person. A policeman charged is no different than a grocery clerk or a student. And every person is equal under the law, and if they'd committed illegal acts, they should print it so that everybody knows that policemen are human and they committed these acts, and then other policemen will know that they will not be protected if they commit illegal acts. So when you let people get away with what they did in killing a president and in killing a senator or a candidate for president, and I keep saying candidate because it's an election year, and this is a heavy time, it permeates the local level and the secrecy that you have allowed your lives to take over, you're going to feel now. Now, with the Chipka thing, everybody got excited last week. Everybody was sending in petitions and wiring and calling the White House. And I looked at the emotionalism because you were concerned about a tidal wave on the coast. You were concerned about the fish or the sea otters, and I'm not putting down those things. But when there's a national tidal wave, when I go on every week to talk about a national tidal wave that is swallowing the nation up, 
I don't get the same emotional response, even around here at the station or anywhere. Everyone gets excited when they think there's going to be a tidal wave on the coast of California or in Japan. Why wouldn't they see what happened in Washington in 1963 on November the 22nd? That was the biggest tidal wave of all, and nobody's screaming and yelling. You think we can get a little motion someday about that, Gloria? Yeah, we can always keep hoping. I mean, all these petitions and all these names, and I'm throwing out facts and information every week, and some people still want to think that the assassination is a special compartment, that this is either May's thing or Jim Garrison's thing. This isn't my thing. That when the oil spills outside of San Francisco, you can get more people in San Francisco wiping off seagulls than you can get riding to Washington to open the archives and find out who killed John Kennedy. Well, don't you think, May, that many of the people don't believe that what happened in 63 applies to what is happening today? This is uh, the response I've had. Well, I think the people but somewhat it believe it, but they have the feeling that you can't fight it. There's this general apathy. And uh, I think that I could cite 12 instances in the news in the last two days where people have been able to fight back, to use the legal system to fight back. Just this morning in the paper, um, there was an incident in Sand City where a gentleman had a trial that moved past two courts and went up to San Jose, Brady Avery, where he said that he was being run off the street because they wanted to get the blacks out of Sand City. And he took it to the court. And there was nobody. The blacks in Seaside who worked within the system in, were embarrassed by Brady because he was bringing up issues they don't want to think exist. So they ignored him. And Brady walked into the Peace and Freedom office one day and said, what will I do? The, the mayor of this little town is running me off the street, and so is his appointed a policeman. And I have a shop where I want to earn my living fixing cars, and I don't have a chance. Well, today he won a suit of $42,000. And if he won that suit, it was because... 12 or 14 people believed in him. And when he took it to a jury and a judge, within the system, he won his case. But I could name 14 people that believed in Brady Avery for over two years. And today he won. Let's get to something lighter, Gloria. This is clever. <laughs> <laughs> you know, last week we talked about the sex life of the Kennedys. Right. And this week, you're going to talk about what? The lavatory habit of President Nixon. Is that okay on the air? As long I as so. I refer to it as the lavatory habit? Right. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to call attention to a little article that was in the um, San Jose Mercury last Sunday. There's a magazine section of question and answers that is very good. They're relevant questions and very pertinent answers Somewhat serious, usually, but there was a question in Sunday's paper that I just have to take for the lighter side. Question, I've been told that in his lavatory, President Nixon has a special telephone direct to Dick Helms, head of the CIA. Can you verify it? Answer, President Nixon has a phone in his lavatory, which can be connected to anyone he chooses to reach. The reason I get that out, Gloria, is that it brings fond memories to me because it flashes back to the very first political phone call I ever made in my life, and it was in 1960 from Beverly Hills, California, to Drew Pearson, and it involved Richard Nixon going to the lavatory. <laughs> and it was the day of the election when he was running against John Kennedy, and the circumstances in the newspaper were very weird. It was my first sleuthing, but he had gone to vote with Pat and the kids in Whittier at his old home site, and... He left Pat, and I saved the articles because she didn't seem to know where he was, but they split in separate cars, and then he began his trip down to Tijuana. And the newspaper had, again, what we referred to earlier as a cover story. He gave 20 pencils to this garage attendant. He had a chocolate soda at La Jolla. It, it had a very detailed thing about what he did, and it seems that what, where he went and nobody could find him was down to Tijuana to have lunch with the mayor, of Tijuana, and then he went into the lavatory, and they called attention to this in the paper, and uh, did his thing, and came out and came back for the long ride up to the Ambassador Hotel where he met his family and received the bad news that he was not the President of the United States. Now, I had the feeling that Richard somehow knew that he might lose that evening. He had a 50-50 chance of losing, and if he lost, it would be because of the pressure of the China lobby and the group that were interested in the Quimoy debates and intensifying the interest in Asia over our 
domestic problems in the United States, intensifying a Cold War and so forth. And I felt that if anybody knew who he was meeting with down there in that particular room, it would change the course of history in some way. <laughs> now, you can't say that 1,000 days later or so that, that history was changed and had anything to do with that particular meeting, but I felt that in, that it was important that he ran down the way he did and met and came right back. And Drew Pearson wrote me several letters on this subject and was unable to verify who he had seen except for the mayor in Tijuana. I wonder, my question is, why the mayor of Tijuana and why Election Day? Well, the whole article was written in such a mysterious tone that I just called to see just what is going on. Now, today's news had an article on the My Lie charges again, and we mentioned this before. Um, Colonel Orrin Henderson is being charged with covering up the conspiracy in the My Lie massacre. And I want to make a suggestion to the people who listen, because you say, what can we do to affect new laws and, and new changes? And there are new changes being made. There were a lot of things in the news in the last two weeks that are good, in spite of the overwhelming tightness of control and bad. And I do think that it is very important to make in your heads the idea that someday any congressman who receives information of a conspiracy to murder the president or the candidate or public officials who does not investigate that conspiracy should be subject to the same charges that Mr. Henderson is being charged with today. You see, he's going before a military panel for failure to investigate the slaying of civilians at My Lai and failure to report to superiors on the incident. Now, a third charge that he was charged with, which has been dropped, was making a false official statement during the pre-trial investigation. I suggest that you write to your public officials, which I'm going to be doing in the next two weeks, writing to every member of the Congress like I have from time to time, and to say, you, Mr. Fulbright, or you, Mr. Urban, or Mr. Kennedy, or anybody who receives information, or Senator, uh, Representative Talcott, if you receive information from some person who is a serious researcher who has a legal case against the National Archives, against particular people involved in these assassinations, if you fail to investigate these assassinations, if you fail to report them to your superior, like the Justice Department, if you make false statements, that there was no conspiracy or that you have investigated when you haven't, then you should be charged with murder or conspiracy to murder if the truth does come out under another administration, that you should be charged with murder on the same way that this particular man is being charged. Because the men in Congress have much information about the conspiracy of these murders and how this country is run, and they pretend they don't know. And by pretending they don't know, we get in worse shape every day. So I think that the time will come that some law is going to have to be made starting at a local level and moving up to the state level and the national level that if you have evidence of these crimes and you cover them, you are charged for the crime the same as if you committed it. The, the people on up can't conceal these any longer. I don't think it's fair. Now, Lyndon Johnson, did you see the picture of him in the paper last night in the Herald? <laughs> <laughs> he was plugging his book. Plugging he, his book. LBJ was plugging his book, and he's holding it up, the vantage point. Well, it should be the vantage point because he took all the documents away, the secret documents, and uh, he's got them down in Texas, so we can't see it from where he sees it. Lyndon Johnson was plugging his book. This is what he said in quotes. Buy a book and give it to the generations to come and let them know how good the blessings of the good Lord were to us in the 1960s, end quote. Well, they were pretty good to him because he wasn't charged with murder, and he isn't under arrest, and he's still alive. And uh, the Lord's been pretty good to him so far. But I also thought of all the people around Lyndon Johnson that the Lord's been good to in 1960. His friend Ross Perot down there in Texas just made $1 billion in five years doing the computer work for Medicare. That was written up in Ramparts. If we have time, we'll talk about that in a little while. But Ross Perot is the fellow who flies the goodies to the prisoners of war at Christmas to tear your hearts out and returns with the plane and the unopened gifts. And in between 51 years, weeks during the year otherwise, he has accumulated $1 billion doing the data processing 
for Medicare and Medi-Cal that Lyndon Johnson put in for the Good Society. So if you want to read Ramparts, this month has a very large article on how Ross Perot made his money. Uh, it's been a good 1960, and LBJ didn't lose much either. He was supposed to. <clears throat> he did all right. Many, many, many millions. It's rumored at 17 million. And Lady Bird Johnson, who is a large stockholder in Brown and Root, the Texas firm that does the construction for Vietnam, including the tiger cages and much more, uh, did very well in the 1960s. One of the men who was working for Brown and Root at the time of the assassination was George de Mornchot, Lee Oswald's closest friend. Uh, Leon Jaworski. Um, who's now president of the American Bar Association, was Lyndon Johnson's very, very close friend and on the board of directors of the CIA Foundation. I want to go into that in a lot of detail. Um, he did well, and so did the Republic National Bank that Jack Anderson talked about this week that gets fixed $56 million in federal deposits in Dallas alone and pays no interest but then puts the money out to you and charges you interest. They take the money out of your savings, and it's deposited in several banks across the country. It was written up in a lot of detail this last week. The Republic National Bank in Dallas has $56 million of your money sitting there. So they did well in 1960, and so did General Dynamics in Fort Worth making contracts for the F-111 and other Air Force industries, and John Conley did well in the 1960s. He's become the Secretary of Treasury and no doubt will become the Vice President and the President of your United States. And George Bush from Texas is the head of the UN. So Lyndon might say that the good Lord was good to them in the 1960s. He went on to say something else in pushing his book. He said he, he, not a cent of the money from this book is going into his pocket. He was paid $1.6 million for the book. We gave it to the library and the school. This book was written so the young people of the future would be better prepared to bring peace in the world. And all the decisions that, that are in this book are backed up by the 31 million documents in this library. I believe I knew what I was doing better, better than someone else would know what I was doing. I venture to say, Gloria, that the money that goes from the sale of the book will pay the guards to keep part of those 31 million, dollar, 31 million documents locked up. Some of them we're not going to see, like in the National Archives in Washington. You can't see for 75 years because Lyndon Johnson ordered it. He also has top-secret documents down there in Texas. If Lyndon really wanted us to study peace and war, there wouldn't be any top-secret documents at all. But it'll take all the money that he's got from this book to guard the documents. <laughs> it's going to take more guards than that because someday there's <coughs> Ellsbergs coming out of the woods. Now, did you read that the CIA is intensifying its United States... Uh, domestic, isn't it? Do, the domestic spy shakeup, yes. Uh, the overall rule in the United States is going to intensify. This came out since we met last week. It was in Saturday's news that the White House announced that Richard Nixon has ordered an overhaul of the government's intelligence operations, and Richard uh, Helms will be given an overall supervisory role. It's going to do the community-wide responsibility in the United States. Now, it's very important that they reorganize the CIA in the United States. They're going to make a net assessment within the National Security Council. You see, there's people like Daniel Ellsberg, who had access to documents, who are telling the people, this is a state of emergency, you have to be told the truth. There is Louis Tackwood in Los Angeles talking about the police department committing some very heavy crimes and murders, and he had to know more than... He hasn't mentioned the Bobby Kennedy case, but he's on the periphery of all the other murders in California. And he would have to be hunted and charged with treason if, they could, if he got his hands on those documents, you see. A lot of people are not afraid of the treason charge. They're going to speak up. But Richard Nixon has to consolidate what is going on in the United States. The article went on to say it will reconstitute the U.S. Intelligence Board and set up priorities for gathering national intelligence and supervising its dissemination and protecting the security of intelligence, material, sources, and methods. You see, it, they have to find out who is taking this stuff or who has the information and protect themselves against this information coming out to the people because everything... That word protect bothers me. Protect themselves? Mm -hmm. Well, you see, crimes were committed, and there is evidence to prove that crimes were committed. 
And what the paranoid people feel who were part of this crime is that if we lock up all this material, no one will know. If we control the courts and the justice of the Supreme Court, no one will know. But some people might even risk their life and leave the country and have hold of one document that would overthrow the people that are in power today. And they have to tighten up who everybody is seeing or talking to or sources of information and get ready with heavy charges of um, uh, treason. Well, that's awfully big brother, isn't it? Well, we're here. Mm -hmm. We're here. Uh, there, I got information from a ex-law enforcement man in Los Angeles last week on just how big brother we are. And if I were to stop for a traffic citation, the officer can sit in his car and give my name. And while he's writing the ticket, it, within like seven seconds, my entire political profile is given back to him. And then they, they just say, well, who are you with? What are you doing? Where are you going? Who are these people? Just to fill in a progress report on what you're doing. They have everyone in the state of California. I'm sure almost everyone in the United States well, they, within seven seconds, they go back to their car now. They don't stand by your window. I think very few people are aware that there are dossiers on just about everybody. Everyone. That, uh, the CII in California is like the national CIA, and it goes all over uh, the United States. So, that, you know, in the old days, you went through a light or you're going too fast, you got a ticket, and the friendly cop stood up by the side of your car, and he talked and he wrote his thing. He goes back to his car and sits there for about five minutes. I asked, can I get out of my car and go back and listen? I asked this particular gentleman and hear what he's saying. And he said, well, yeah, but things then come back in code. Mm -hmm. And everything has a code. And um, but, but they go to their car and they call in. And they get the rundown of everything you're doing and where your head is at. Somebody, I mentioned this to somebody the other day. And they said, well, I was stopped and this happened. And, and they called in and got all kinds of data. So uh, next time somebody wants to give you a ticket... Get out of your car and go sit with him while he writes it and get an education in what's happening in California. Take down a lot of numbers. <laughs> yeah. Because it would be in code, right? It would be in code. Well, just, just get the lingo to see what is happening, you see. Now, last week in our local community on Tuesday night, there was a meeting at uh, Monterey Peninsula College for the Monterey County Soul Dad Committee where they invite ex-convicts and local people, families of convicts in Soledad now to talk about problems that are going on in that prison because it's close to our local community. And you wonder, well, how does this fit in with dialogue assassination or political assassinations? But I'm going to tell you something that happened at the meeting, and I was hoping this particular person could be here today, but he couldn't, and I'm going to bri briefly mention it, and then I'll have him down as a guest. Oh, that would be... That would yeah. be very nice. But at, at the meeting, uh, Terry Mangan was there talking about uh, radicals in the area. He had just come back from Washington and testified about radicals in the Fort Ord area that tried to influence the soldiers. And there were a lot of policemen and law enforcement officers from the peninsula at this particular meeting. And at the meeting was a young gentleman who had been with the Sheriff's Department in Los Angeles County. And he was trying to explain how within the police department evidence is planted that they have foreknowledge of murders that the police department sheriff's department are guilty of committing crimes and if, this is what i've been saying on the show all along but based upon my research i know this is true so of course the police gentlemen were very defensive this doesn't happen it doesn't happen it couldn't be and even though it may not happen at a local level, the point is that it does happen at a national level. We're not sure what happens at a local <laughs> level. If you don't point out the problem, you can't cure it. So in the course of the conversation, the gentleman who was a guest there, who come down from San Francisco, said, you're not going to believe the story I'm telling you. He said, it's a very heavy thing, and it has to do with the Manson case. Okay, well, we'll, um, we'll stop right now before you get on with that, May, and make a station break. You're listening to Dialogue Assassination with Mae Brussel. This is KLRB Stereo FM, Carmel by the Sea.